This is the Science Communicator, and today I have a huge pleasure to talk uh, with uh, Dr. Peter Agri, an American physician and, uh, and molecular biologist who in 2003 was awarded the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for the discovery of um, aquaporins. Uh, good morning, pro uh, Professor. Good morning, Doctor. Uh, thank you so much for joining me today. Good morning. It's my pleasure to be with you. And uh, you yourself uh, call uh, aquaporins the plumbing systems, uh, the, pl the plumbing system for cells. Um, I must say that at a very, I remember that at a very early stage of primary education, I was told that the human body was uh, largely composed of uh, water. So one might wonder why do we need some special channels for transporting water. Now I'm lifting the veil of secrecy a little bit. Why do we need some special proteins? And so uh, from the very beginning, from the basics, I would like to ask you what are aquaporins and uh, what is their function? Well, you went to a good school because that's absolutely correct. Our bodies are about two thirds water by mass. <clears throat> and water crosses membranes of all cells with a finite degree of movement. But some cells let water in and out very, very rapidly. For example, if you should get a foreign body on the surface of your eye, it will tear up instantly. Pavlov's dog, here's the bell, he salivates. It doesn't take minutes, it's, it's seconds. So for water to move across membranes of specific tissues rapidly, it needs a special channel. Just as we have automobiles moving around the countryside, if you want to get somewhere fast, you go on the Autobahn or the Autostrada in Italy. So it's a matter of velocity. We could survive without most of the aquaporins individually, but together to respond and to, to have a chance of surviving, the movement of water going fast is important. And it seems this is important throughout biology. All living organisms have one or more members of the aquaporin water channel family. It's a simple pore-like structure that lets water through and nothing else. Yes, and is there one kind of aquaporins or are there many kinds of aquaporins? Well, there are several varieties. They all seem to have the same theme. They seem to be a tetrameric assembly of four subunits, each with its own aqueous pore. And the residues lining the pore are conserved pretty highly, but there are some variations. For example, the aquaporin one in our red cells is always active. If you take a drop of blood, red blood cells and drop it into seawater, it will crenate and the cells will shrink. Water leaves the cells. If you take a drop of blood and drop it into distilled water or fresh water, it instantly breaks and all the hemoglobin is released. So it's a very rapid movement. Our kidneys have in the terminal part, the collecting duct, the, a second aquaporin, which is regulated. So the aquaporin 1 appears to be normally at the present in the membrane. The aquaporin 2 moves back and forth based on vasopressin. So if we play tennis or soccer on a hot day, we're sweating, releasing water from sweat, we're a little dehydrated, our kidneys will respond by reabsorbing water maximally from the filtrate. So the variations have to, something to do with the, the function. Mm -hmm. But overall, they're pretty similar. The aquaporins in the roots of a carrot and the aquaporins in my brain are very similar, more similar than I sometimes like them to be. Mm -hmm. mm, and I can imagine easily that in uh, there might be defects, some genet genetic uh, defects in aquaporins. Um, what could be the consequences of possible defects? Well, that's a, that's a very good point. When we first discovered these, we knew they were present in red cells and certain t renal tubules. And we assumed it must be uh, essential for life and a mutation would cause a disaster. What we discovered is there are a few people who have mutations in the aquaporin gene and they can't express it, and they look perfectly normal unless they're stressed. So uh, normally we, we go to bed at night and we sleep seven or eight hours if we're lucky, 
we awakened in the morning and we've had nothing to drink for seven or eight hours. Mm -hmm. We're a little dehydrated and our, our kidneys are filled with the entire nighttime collection of urine. But the next few drops are quite concentrated. So it, it, it functions when it's needed. And these individuals may look normal in, under normal modern life, but if they're in a desert or in a place where water is not possible, for example, as a patient on a gurney in a nursing home, unable to call out, then it can be very consequential. Likewise, the aquaporin in the lens of the eye in the mouse leads to cataracts. A mouse living in a laboratory cage with cataracts does just fine. The food's right there, there are no predators. But let him go in the wild, he'll have big, big trouble. You said at some point that you made your discovery by serendipity. I'm not sure if, I pre if I'm pronouncing this word correctly. Uh, sure. What did you mean by this? I think my scientific discoveries are often, there's an element of luck involved. Everything is not planned. We're not an engineering enterprise, we're a discovery enterprise. And so we were searching for the presence of the RH blood group antigen, the rhesus blood group antigen on red cells, which is very important in maternal fetal compatibility. We isolated for the first time by a biochemical means the, the 32 kilodalton core protein of the RH protein, and a slightly smaller protein came along, which we thought was a fragment of the aquaporin of the of the RH protein. It turned out to be a, a completely different protein, and so it, it was not expected, but it was curious. It was very. It turned out to be very abundant, but it didn't stain well, so no one had seen it before. So we were just following the curiosity. What could this possibly be? And had the good fortune of talking about this to quite a few scientists, and one had a great idea, test for water permeability. So that, that is serendip. But I guess, as Pasteur said, chance favors the prepared mind. It also favors people who have friends who are very intelligent, and my, my colleagues are very intelligent. Mm. Now I'd like to ask you about uh, research, which I understand is related to, to, to the research, to, to your studies of um, aquaporins, uh, because in uh, 2008, you became a director of the Johns Hopkins Malaria uh, Research uh, Institute. And malaria is still a very much a widespread disease in tropical uh, regions. Uh, what um, did or has this research involved? Well, the, the goal of working on malaria is something I carried from my student days. <clears throat> we worked on red cells thinking eventually we'd be working on malaria in red cells, because that's the most important disease of red cells. But the parasite of malaria, like all other living organisms, has a, a gene expressing a polypeptide very similar to the aquaporins that are varied, they also are permeable to water and glycerol. So we studied that and I was honored to be invited to serve as director of the Johns Hopkins Malaria Research Institute, a wonderful program that Johns Hopkins has because of a magnificent gift from Michael Bloomberg and the Bloomberg Philanthropies with the goal that we would, by scientific methods, eliminate malaria worldwide. Well, we did a, a good job, but it, malaria is not eradicated. There's still much more work to do. So it was a sort of a fulfillment of a long-standing dream. Before we ever thought of water channels, we were thinking of malaria, but we had the opportunity later, so we pursued it. Mm -hmm. mm. And um, you, you also, for years, uh, were involved in, in um, the so-called science diplomacy, I think a cause which is really close to my heart as well. Um, what uh, was the idea behind science diplomacy? What activities have you undertaken sure. uh, within this program? Well, first off, I, I've always loved to travel. As a high school student, I traveled in Europe and the Soviet Union and I found it so exciting. I wanted a career that had international activities. So the term science diplomacy has been used widely to describe activities wherein 
scientists will interact with scientists in other countries with the goal of maybe fostering relations between the countries, maybe to create a specific facility, for example, the, the synchrotron in Jordan, which is a effort led by many countries, or it can be a method of increasing the interactions of our governments. So it's a rather vague term, but I think it, we, we use it to identify our activities, which are not official diplomatic activities. We don't work through our government. We're private scientists. And when I first got involved in this, it was with the American Association for the Advancement of Science. That's the organization that publishes Science Magazine, and it's it's a private organization. It's a not-for-profit organization, and so their activities and the Center for Science Diplomacy got me started. When I was president of the AAAS, we visited North Korea, Cuba, Myanmar, Iran. In all cases, the scientists were very welcoming and we created friendships, which we hope will foster improved relations. Is this program still going on? Well, it's, it is. And there are young people that are getting involved. And this, this has really been a, a wonderful thing. At Johns Hopkins, we have a group of graduate students in science who on their own time have organized meetings in Washington at the new Bloomberg Center on Pennsylvania Avenue. It's a beautiful building, just one kilometer from the Capitol. You can see it out of the windows. And the embassies have been putting on science programs with their science envoys. And so I, I, I'm very pleased with that. I'm 75 years old now. I, I, I will hope to make a few more trips and get involved, but it's the next generation that counts. I see. All right, so now for dessert, I would like to ask you, how did it happen? I'm really, oh, I'm always uh, curious about that. How did it happen that you became uh, fascinated by science, that you actually um, decided to make a career in science? Well, I, my father was a chemistry professor at a small college in Minnesota. So I, I grew up with science. My, my brothers and I were, were invited up to his, my dad's laboratory. He would do simple experiments. They were not experiments, they were really demonstrations, but they were very interesting. And so I always had in the back of my mind, science would be interesting, but I never felt I had the ability to, to be a scientist. I was more interested in the, the application of science to medical problems. So I became a medical doctor. And in the training to become a medical doctor, you must take a lot of science. <clears throat> and so I was pursuing science in laboratories to get some background in the medical sciences. And as, as a student at Hopkins Medical School, I had the great fortune of working in the laboratory of Bradley Sack, who was an infectious disease doctor studying cholera. And so it was an opportunity. And when I worked in the laboratory, I found I, I was not too bad at it. I was not the best by anyone's definition, but I, good enough. And we made some progress. And it's sort of like a, a going fishing. If you catch a fish, it creates a lot of interest. You know, try it some more. So it was never with the idea I would conquer a field. It was more a matter of being involved in something that was a worthwhile enterprise. I still have great anxiety about my understanding of science. I, I think it's, it's rather primitive, but it has proven good enough at times. <laughs> and do you enjoy teaching the younger generation? Yes, I, I, the next generation is so important and interacting with the students, whether it's teaching as a formal lecturer or as a, an informal laboratory mentor or in discussion groups, they are our future. And I'm very excited what, what they'll accomplish. They're our greatest treasure. Yes, exactly. So 
thank you very much, Dr. Agri, uh, for, uh, for meeting with me, for joining me today. And uh, of course, I, I, wish you, um, I wish you all the best for your, uh, for your um, subsequent undertakings um, and projects, programs. Well, thank you for the opportunity. I enjoyed our conversation and look forward to more interactions. Thank you very much.